Forget who you are. So it's like being in a virtual reality game. There's two ways to play a virtual reality game. One is to go into it and you see your avatar and you laugh. That's just my avatar. The other is you go in there and you think you are your avatar. Now all of a sudden, that's a different thing. Now you're scared to death. We're in a simulation in which the, our avatar is apparently on the line. In some sense, spiritual enlightenment is waking up to the fact that, oh, my body's just an avatar. It's not the truth. And then all of a sudden, that makes life a very, very different kind of thing. Before we start this episode, we are planning on making this the number one happiness podcast in the world. And so if you want to show your support, please check out our Patreon. First of all, thank you for making the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for your kind invitation, for I wanted to ask you, what led you to integrate meditation so deeply into your life? I couldn't sleep. So you know, I didn't want to take drugs. And so it was about 22 years ago. I'd, well, I was about 46 years old. <clears throat> and I slept like a baby and all of a sudden I couldn't sleep. And so I, I decided, like, oh, I better do something about it. And I didn't want to take pills. And so <clears throat> I had a friend, Joe Arpea, uh, a very good friend. He was a student in the class I taught. And he was an, an excellent meditator. And so he, he sort of turned me on to the idea of meditation. And he had written a book on meditation that I reviewed for him and had a forward by the Dalai Lama and so forth. And so, <clears throat> so I knew a little bit about meditation. Um, but then I decided to just get into it. And, because I didn't want to, so so it was it wasn't really a spiritual thing. It was really more <clears throat> I want I need to sleep and <clears throat> meditation seems to be a the the least objective uh, uh, objectionable way to to do that. I thought it had to do with your uh, interface theory, uh, getting out of the kind of matrix. Well, as it happens later on, I realized that the two integrated. So I wasn't smart enough to you know to put this stuff together ahead of time. I, I it's sort of. Later on, I realized that what I was learning in meditation certainly did uh, fit into the research that I was doing. So, so I can't take any claim for being a smart guy that figured this all out. No, it just happened. <laughs> How do you think it affected your perception? Because you say in the interface theory that evolution has given rise to this interface, right? Like a desktop, there's these icons, and it's like right. space and time and objects in real life. And so... Right. We believe, like you said, that life is, this is reality, but what, what, is your, what is your concept in here? In the framework of evolutionary theory, if you take that framework seriously, it tells you the probability is zero that what you see, space and time and physical objects, the things that you see are objective reality. What it tells you is that under that theory, the probability is one that what you've got is something more like a user interface or, or a, a virtual reality headset that lets you play the game of life. And now I, I should now say that there is a sense in which what I'm saying is not news. So for example, Steve Pinker in his book, How the Mind Works in 1998, basically said, yeah, that the there are all sorts of uh, yeah, evolutionary pressures for um, cognition not to have true beliefs and perception to not have true beliefs. Uh, he made one exception, though. He said maybe everyday middle-sized objects, tables and chairs, forks and spoons and so forth, maybe maybe we get that pretty much right. And so, so basically what I did was just add a little footnote to what Pinker had said and said, well, we don't even get tables and chairs and forks and spoons right. That, that, even that is part of the user interface that's, that's illusory. Um, and people's intuitions then are, go, you know, wild. They say, well, this doesn't make sense. I mean, evolution is about survival of the fittest or the survival of the fitter, put it that way, it's survival of the fitter. And surely it makes you more fit to see the truth. So what, what, what gives here? And, and, and the reply is that if, if you're playing a, a video game, like a, a virtual reality Grand Theft Auto with multiplayers and so forth. Now, there, there is a reality in, in this metaphor. Uh, there's some supercomputer with, you know, that, and what you're really doing in that supercomputer is toggling millions of bits in a precise order very, very quickly to play the game. Now, would it help you to win the game if you had to toggle those bits? Or is it much easier to win the game if you have a headset and a steering wheel and, and a dashboard and, and, you know, gas pedal? Well, I would give long odds that the guy with the, the interface is going to beat the guy that has to go in there and, and toggle the bits by himself or herself very, very quickly. So, so that's what evolution did for us. It, it, it guide, 
it gives us perceptions that guide adaptive behavior. And, what, and the way they do that is to just give us a user interface that guides adaptive behavior. That's so interesting because then it poses a lot of questions. So what is the reality behind that interface and behind those icons and those things? So what do you think about that? Right. Now, that's, of course, the, the, an important next question. And it's an, also important to point out that evolution can't tell you what's next, right? So the theory can only tell you within my little framework, here's what happens. Organisms compete for resources, they mate, and then the more successful and reproduce. So it can tell you that story. But, but, but then it says, here's the end of my story. The, the end of my story is, in fact, uh, nothing you see is the truth, and this is just a headset. So you need a deeper story, and I can't tell you what the deeper story is. So we have to actually, as scientists, and, and by the way, again, this is, this is not like weird or exceptional. This is the way it always works in science. You have one theory, you find its limits, it can't tell you what's next. All you have to take, this is the fun part of science, this is what the, the, the younger generation of scientists always love, is that the old guys, the old men, old men and women of science, um, their theories are going to be overthrown and they're going to come up with the new theories. And that's, that's, that's just the way it works. But you have to be creative, you have to think out of the box, and what, what the old theories do for you, though, is very important. You come up with something out of the box, you then have to show precisely how it projects back into mm. the old theories, like projects back into evolution and space-time. And when it projects back in, it better give you what we already have the empirical data s- says is true within that context. So, so, you, so in other words, the theories that we overthrow can't tell us what to do next. They can't say, here's what you should look for. But what they can do is give you a thumbs down for your bad ideas. So if you have a if you have an idea, I think this is it, and you project it back into the earlier theories, and, and it goes well, then you have to go back to the drawing board or refine your. So so evolution and you know our our laws of physics inside space time and so forth are going to be very very important theories for trying to answer the question that you just asked. What, what's beyond space time? What's outside of evolutionary framework? Now, it's remarkable that just in the last ten years, the physicists. The high energy theoretical physicists, so it's a specific branch of physics, not all, not all physicists. So uh, when I say the physicists, I mean the high energy theoretical physicists, which is an elite group within physics or a small group. They have clearly understood that space time is not fundamental. They, under, they understand that it falls apart at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds, the Planck scale. And they have discovered new structures beyond space-time. So they're literally taking the first steps of science outside of space-time, and they're finding stuff, really interesting stuff. They call positive geometries, uh, including geometries like the amplitudehedron, associahedron, and cosmological polytope. They're, so they're finding these positive geometries and these mathematical st- combinatorial structures um, that classify them, that, that sort of tell you features about their organization and so forth and things like decorated permutations. So this is just in the last 10 years. This is all brand new. And the string of discoveries has been so powerful and and so insightful that the European Research Council, which is a funding agency in Europe, big big one in Europe, just launched a 10 million euro uh, effort with uh, you know a multinational team of scientists from from not just Europe but the United States and ever, elsewhere to start to explore these positive geometries. So, so science is now taking its first w- steps. We, we've taken off our headset. We're taking off the space-time headset. And, and that's a big deal because we thought that space-time was the fundamental reality. We thought science was exploring the nature of fundamental reality. No, we were studying our headset. And, and, and we got good. We got good with the tools of science exploring our headset, and now we can use those same tools to, when we take off the headset and go outside. Now, but that doesn't really answer your question because the, the issue then is they found these positive, they're like these obelisks, like in, in 2001, the space odyssey, the, the obelisk is sitting there and all the apes are pounding and hooting and hollering. They know it's really important. It has some really important meaning and they have no clue what it is. Well, that's where we are. We've taken off our headset for the first time in human history in the last decade. We're looking outside space-time, and what do we see? Obelisks, positive geometries. And, and 
so we're in the hooting and hollering stage. What, what is this all about? What does it mean? We're, we, we don't know. So this is an, a very exciting time in science. I'm, I'm proposing that there's a dynamical process deeper than these positive geometries. And, and I, would, I would imagine that most physicists are, would agree that they want a dynamical theory. You know, physics is usually about dynamical systems, things that change. Not just platonic solids mm -hmm. sitting there doing nothing. Uh, where the, you, where did the, you know, the, the question obviously comes up, who ordered that? Why did God do that, right? Or, you know, wh why is that the thing that we would find first outside of our headset? It, 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 surely there's got to be some deeper story than just, and God said there were positive geometries. Don't ask questions, right? There's got to be some question that goes deeper. So I'm looking at a theory of consciousness, a dynamics of consciousness, that I, my goal is to show that it gives rise to these positive geometries. That's so interesting because we we live most of our life in this headset believing that the illusion is real. And then it conjures, it yeah. conjures up the, the, the question of, if I remove the headset of space and time, then how's my reality going to shift? And how am I going to actually see the truth? So then what do you think about that? Now, this is a question that um, is not new to science, right? So even spiritual traditions have thought about this for, for thousands of years. They've not had the precise mathematical tools and experimental techniques that, that scientists have. So, so they've only been able to couch their ideas in informal language and, and in, in, relatively informal uh, experiments. Uh, but, but still, the, the spiritual traditions have a lot, a lot of insights. They, they would point out that uh, anything that you describe in words is just a description. It's, it, it cannot exhaust the truth. They're, they're, the truth is going to transcend whatever you can say, which isn't to say that it's pointless to make descriptions. I mean, it, it clearly isn't pointless. When we So space-time is not fundamental, but look what Einstein's theory of space-time did. It gave us GPS. It gave us all sorts of stuff. It's, so, so even though the descriptions aren't the truth, maybe they're just descriptions of one aspect or a projection of, of the truth, but they're not the... So if, as long as we're appropriately modest about what we're doing in science and also in our spiritual, you know, uh, doctrines and so forth, then, then I think we're, we're, we're fine. The truth then, what, 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 what that means though is no description is the truth. And that means no description of you is the truth. No description of me is the truth. Now, now that's stunning. When you, when you think about that, that, that means that Whatever I am transcends any scientific description. There are useful scientific descriptions of a projection of my reality, and, and we should, as scientists and human beings, explore those and enjoy those. But we should always recognize that the map is never the territory. The description is not the thing. And all we're doing at best is, you know, feeling a piece of the elephant, right? The, the tail or the leg or with the trunk or whatever. But But we... That's where the meditation then comes in. In some sense, on the one hand, with the science, I'm, I'm focused on really precise descriptions of aspects of projection of the truth. But in meditation, when you, you let go of all descriptions, that's, that's what it is. It's, that's, meditation is no thought, just being in complete interior silence. Then there's a different kind of knowing that happens. It's a knowing without concepts. It's, you could just call it a being. And so, and there, there in some sense, you find that you are the truth, but there's nothing you can say about it. it it's, but you know it in a, in a way that's not a conceptual way of knowing. So it's not a, an inferior way of knowing. It's, it's perhaps a superior way of knowing. The conceptual is, is, is much less deep than this being kind of knowledge. And so as a scientist now, I'm, I'm, I spend time every day in meditation and, and letting go of concepts. And then when I use concepts, I try not to be sloppy. I try to be absolutely precise and make mathematically precise predictions that can be tested. So it's very, very interesting you know, to, to go from no concepts and just being the truth to Okay, now I'm going to talk about concepts that, that I know aren't 
the truth. I know they're not the truth, but they seem to be unbelievably useful descriptions of a perspective on the truth. So that's what what reality seems to be about is that what, what, whatever we are transcends uh, description, and yet it's important for us to spend time in in descriptions because we're doing it. So, you know. There's a beautiful quote that says, "Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. It's seeing through the facade of pretense. It's the complete eradication of everything we imagine to be true." By Adya Shanti. How much can you relate to that quote? Very much so. The the only thing that I would add to that um, is that enlightenment is not a goal to be achieved. You, you either choose to be here now and accept what is now in, in complete acceptance of this moment, or you don't. If you do, you're enlightened this moment, and if you don't, you're not enlightened this moment. There's no time involved. You're either enlightened now or you're not. And there's no nothing about the future. It's it's am I completely here in the moment and accepting the now with no complaint whatsoever? If the answer is yes, then you are enlightened in this moment. And as soon as the answer is no, you are not enlightened in that moment. So there's there's no there's no striving, there's no future. Uh, you, you either choose to be with what is now and accept it completely, or most of the time you don't. And, and, and so most of the time, even those who are called enlightened are, will, will have periods of non-enlightenment, most. Maybe not some. There, there may be some people. But I, I'm not one of them. So I mostly um, spend most of my time in non-enlightenment, but every once in a while I spend some yeah, time in same. enlightenment. <laughs> same. I do have a question. How did you start your spiritual journey? How did I start it? Uh, well, on the left foot, um, in some sense. Um, I was raised in um, a fundamentalist uh, Christian church that believed that they were right and everybody else, even other Christians of different denominations, were wrong and were likely to go to hell. And, and so it was a tough time for me because that's pretty strong stuff. And to, to think that all of your friends from other churches are, are going to hell and, 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 and it was so, so it was a weird thing where there were some important, you know, good ideas. And then there was complete nonsense like that. And so, so that was the start of my, my spiritual journey was to, to be, uh, put into that kind of spiritual um, situation, and and so it took me many many years to recover from that. Because when you're a child, you mm. just accept the stuff. You know, it was very very hard to argue against the adults when you're yeah. you <laughs> don't have anywhere. It's just hard. So you so they tell you this stuff and they they reinforce it with punishments and so forth. So you, so. So I'm I'm still in the process of unlearning that, but but fortunately there are also within Christianity, and this was, was a big help to me. There are some like the um, Benedictine monks who practice meditation, and so that was for me one of the that was a lifeline because here was a Christian group that was doing meditation, and so I could make the bridge right because meditation I I. I Actually, when I was growing up, um, the, I was told that the meditation was processed from the devil. Yeah, same. And you, you, you too. Okay, so so you you know this the situation. <laughs> so you 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 go into it. You, the, the flames of hell are there. We're just waiting for you if you meditate. So it's 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 a real mess. Uh, and so it, it really helped to find um, some. Ben now, of course, I was raised in a Protestant church. These were Benedictine. They're Catholic, so and already you know I've been told that they're going to go to hell. But, but so, 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 but still, it was it was a it was a help to me to to see uh, uh, Father Keating, Thomas Keating, and his work on on meditation, um, and then to learn that he had, you know went to Zen sessions and and you know, knew the Buddhist approach quite well, and 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 so it it I, I gradually. See, my father wasn't actually a minister. So, I mean, I was a preacher kid there for a while. Um, 
So it took, it, you, know, you, you have to rise above your upbringing at some point, but, but it, it took me a long time. And, and I think that still uh, emotionally, um, I mean, intellectually I understand this, but the, but the emotions that get programmed when you're a child, um, a mere intellectual understanding doesn't rewire that. You ha- actually have to undo the emotions. So I'm still in the process of doing that. That's so interesting because it also kind of relates to the whole process of letting go of the headset. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's... Yeah, it, it's surprising the convergence in what I've been doing now. That, that, that the... I didn't expect the big result in evolution. I just expected that it would be the case that, you know, it was just too expensive and too time consuming for us to see the truth. I, but but when, when I realized that it went very, very deep and evolution says that it is not, it's a very, very deep reason why we don't see the truth and that it, the fitness payoff functions don't have information about the truth. They, they couldn't. So I, I, I realized this is not a minor point. This is like central to evolution, that the fitness payoff functions are what shape our sensory systems. And the fitness payoff functions almost surely have no information about the truth. So they can't shape us to see the truth. So it's so that was stunning. And then to have that, I'd started meditating just a few years before I started doing the evolutionary work. So to have the evolutionary work sort of confirm that yeah, was pretty pretty remarkable. Now I had earlier, so in 1998, I published a book called um, "Visual Intelligence: uh, Why Evolution." No, so, um, yeah, how evolution hid the truth from our eyes, or, or why evolution hid the truth from our eyes. And in that, I was showing how we construct what we see, and I made the. I started to talk about a headset. So I do in the very last chapter. I talk about this as as being a headset, but I didn't. You know, that was just sort of me as a vision scientist saying, boy, well, we're constructing all this stuff. It's like a headset. I didn't really have the evolutionary point of view where it says, yeah, evolution can't tell you the truth. And so that was stunning. And then to have it all line up with the meditation, which was starting to show me that there was a space in which I could just be and have a sense of knowing that was non-conceptual and, and, and have a notion of truth, but without you know, like a correspondence theory of truth where you have concepts and their correspondence to some objective reality. I am the truth being aware of itself and you are the truth being aware of yourself and, and so forth. So, so yeah, it, it, the, the, the confluence of these things, uh, well, I'll put it this way. I certainly wasn't smart enough to orchestrate it. There's one thing that I find exceptional about you that I, admire a lot it's the fact that you have and it it makes sense now why you discovered all these theories and you discovered about consciousness and the truth it's because you have an ability to question yourself and you all you are humble enough to do it and what has led to that or was it always something natural or is it a thought pattern that you cultivated yes well i have started off as dogmatic as anybody else I know. I, you know, I was, that just seems to be human nature. I, I know the truth. And I, you know, as a, as a little kid, you know, you, you, you got the world by the tail, you know, everything, your parents can't tell you. Anything. So I was like that. I'm, but, but then as you then start to learn science, for me, it was, it was science. And, and then learn the history of science. We, we, we knew the earth was flat. We just knew it. And those fools who said it wasn't flat were ridiculed. Well, the fools were right. And then we went through another phase where, well, okay, the earth isn't flat, but it's, it's like a sphere. And, but, but it's the center of the universe. And any fool can see that it is. Every, you know, look, is the earth moving? No, it's just, everything's going around us. So we're the center of the universe. And any fool could know it. And those who said otherwise, again, were wrong. And, and, and once again... It turns out that what everybody knew was true was deeply false. And that's a recurring pattern. And so then you see as a scientist, you, you, in like the 1890s, many physicists uh, 
were certain that physics was over. Newton had done it. Classical mechanics was right. And some discouraged, some professors discouraged young students, bright young students from going into physics because there was nothing real to do there. I mean, there's just a little bit of mopping up. There's Michelson Morley experiments that didn't quite come out right. And there's uh, black body radiation equations aren't, like, but don't worry about it. We, we, we just <laughs> move on. Well, it looks quaint now. When we look back at that, that attitude looks unbelievably quaint and, and, and small minded. So, in some sense, if you don't want to look stupid 100 years from now, be very, very modest about what you think you know. <laughs> Which, I mean, it, 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 because what you think you know now will be overthrown and the next generation will be very happy to do it. So, so, so take everything that you propose with a big grain of salt. And, and humility is just the way to avoid being look, looking like a fool <laughs> down the road. This is just, it's just the right way to do things. We, I, I've had the benefit of being able to look at history and you know the, the people who thought the earth is flat didn't have that benefit. So I can't blame them for thinking the earth is flat, but, but it, I'm not in their position. It, I, now I would be wrong to be dogmatic. It would be stupid to be dogmatic about any aspect of science or any aspect of my work. I, I know too much now to be dogmatic. So <laughs> That's so beautiful. I love, the thing is about this is that it relates not only to the physical world, but also to the mental world, to your thoughts. Because if you don't question if they're real or not, then how do you break free from, from them? So what do you think about that? Uh, absolutely. And, and that's, um, there's a whole branch of, of science and mathematics um, that, that deals with this. It's um, Bayesian inference. Uh, so in Bayesian inference, the idea is that you have prior beliefs and those prior beliefs, then as you get new data, um, how you change what you think is true based on the new data is heavily influenced by your prior beliefs. And in some sense, what I've learned is not to put so much emphasis on my prior beliefs. In, in meditation, what you're doing, one way to think of it from a geek point of view, is you're letting go of all of your prior beliefs. You're letting go of the Bayesian priors. And you're just being with what is, no priors. Now, for me as a scientist, if I want to get new ideas that are out of the box, that's the thing to do. So actually, I use meditation as a way to keep me from being stuck in one little direction based on one little part. In meditation, I, I say, I let, I'm, here I am, I'm going to let go of all prior beliefs. And if, a, if, a, if any thought comes up, any belief comes up, I look at it and I don't believe it. I let it go. Now, when I'm doing my own little theories, I'm saying, okay, for sake of argument, I'm going to assume these beliefs. Let's work. Now let's be absolutely rigorous. Let's write the math. Let's make experimental predictions. No nonsense, no BS. Give me equations. Give me equations or shut up. You know, it's that kind of thing. Give me predictions or shut up. So, so, and they're not contradictory. It's, it's, they're, they're two aspects of, of one life, getting into a space of no concepts, no priors, being the truth, and then taking a thimble full of ideas and, and building a little precise model of one aspect, one projection of the truth going back and forth. So, so, so yes, I, meditation helps me get out of the rut. But it's fun as a scientist, I mean, and, and for me as a scientist, it, it's sort of essential that I have some way of thinking about this that makes sense from a scientific point of view. And the Bayesian inference is, is, is that way. I'm letting go of my priors in meditation, and that's the way to enter a truly new conceptual space. If I don't let go of my priors, I can only see in Bayesian stuff is sort of funny. The, what you see is your posterior. And there's a funny way of thinking about that. If you don't let go of your priors, then you only see your posterior in, in the negative sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
First of all, I love that because I think sometimes our prior beliefs fool us, right? And it's really interesting for me to to figure out, and it's the funniest thing ever, like it's the cosmic joke. We spend our whole life running, trying to find the truth when we are the truth. <laughs> it's like, yes. what do you think about that? Because I see in, lo- yes. in, the, in a lot of what you do is trying to explain something that cannot also be explained but you have a very big talent in trying to explain it simply yeah that's what science tries to do but your, your question is good and and the, one way to put your question is this why would this infinite consciousness that you are and that i am choose to project itself into a human body and become dogmatic and to become even lost in believing it's just this physical body and that I'm right and you're wrong and, and, and create antagonisms and wars. Why, why would the one infinite consciousness do that? I mean, that, that, that's in some sense an ultimate question. Yeah. Here we are, we're doing that. <laughs> and if, if, we're, if we say that we are the... For, you know, I, in some sense, Hoffman is just an avatar of the infinite and Fuad is just another avatar of the infinite. And it's really um, Hoffman and Fuad talking to each other are just two avatars of the infinite that it uses to talk to itself. That's, that's, so what, why do we choose to do that? Well, why did the, the infinite choose to do that? And, and the answer is, of course, I don't know. And it, probably transcends any concepts. But the question does ask, is there some concepts you can bring to this that might be at least useful, helpful pointers? And so here's one, here's one. There are theorems to the effect that no system can ever model itself completely. Like if I have a computer and I want in that computer to, for the computer to build a model of itself, so that it, in some sense, the computer knows itself in that moment. Well, you can do that, but as you do that, the computer has changed because now it has a model that it didn't have before. So now to con- complete the process, you have to model the computer with the model hmm. and so on ad infinitum, right? It, so in other words, you're never done. As soon as you start understanding yourself by building models, then you can never get done. So what if the one... The, the whole, you know, the infinite consciousness, um, what it's doing is understanding itself, modeling itself, knowing, knowing itself. Maybe, maybe the reason we're doing this stuff and we get lost and we have wars and religions and fights and then we slowly wake up and realize, oh, what fools we've been, um, is that that's for, for the infinite non-conceptual intelligence to know itself, what it has to do is to plunge itself into a particular perspective, a conceptual perspective on itself with both feet. Go in with both feet. In other words, forget who you are. (laughs) So this was like being in a virtual reality game, right? There's two ways to play a virtual reality game with first player. You, you, one is to go into it and you see your avatar and you laugh. That's just my avatar. If people can shoot up the avatar, no, no big deal. The other is you go in there and you think you are your avatar. Now, all of a sudden, that's a different thing. When people start, you know, now you're scared to death when people are shooting. If you really think that that's you and, and your avatar is on the line, that's a, and so we're in, we're in a simulation in which the, our avatar is apparently on the line. And it takes us a while to figure out, waking in some, in some sense, spiritual enlightenment is waking up to the fact that, oh, my body's just an avatar. It's not the truth. And then all of a sudden, that makes life a very, very different kind of thing. So that's a very, so, and and maybe then that's the way the one really looks at itself from a perspective seriously, because it actually for a while identifies with that perspective. It gets it thinks that that avatar is what it is, and so it takes it very, very seriously. And then it wakes up to the fact that it's not that avatar, but it learned a lot by looking very, very seriously from that point of view. And and then when it's time to take off the, uh, you know, to take off that headset when we die, 
that information, that perspective is now part of what the one knows about itself from a, from a perspective. So that's the, that's the best mm. I can do. And, but again, even if, if that sounds interesting and, and, and good, I, I would immediately say it cannot be anywhere near the whole truth. Cannot be. So it's, it's just an interesting pointer to it. Um, and uh, rather than saying that should be the end of the discussion, hopefully that's just the beginning of an interesting discussion of other pointers along that line. Before we, we get into kind of the avatars and what happens after we die, which is a very interesting question, I want to first figure out, okay, now with the rise of the Apple Vision Pro virtual headsets, literal virtual headsets, um, are we going to be living in a double trapped interface? Well, possibly, but I think that what's going to happen is that, see, my generation grew up without VR. You know, this, but the next generation where the, you know, when you're five years old or four years old, you already had worn an Apple Vision Pro or, or other, you know, the meta you know, headsets and so forth. Um, The idea of a virtual reality and, and, and my avatar in the virtual reality not being me will be just second place, second nature, right? Just obvious. And I think it won't, you won't have to be very smart to have the question when you take your headset off to just ask the question, well, couldn't this be a headset too, right? When, when you've never had the experience of a headset, that's mm. a strange question to ask. But when you spend several hours a day with the headset on, then it's a very natural question to ask. Well, why shouldn't? Why isn't this also a headset? So I think actually, so I mean, your question. I mean, one direction of your question is that yeah, what could be is that you know we're space time is a headset. Now we're adding these other headsets. We're getting further and further away from reality. That, I mean, that was the thrust thrust of your question, and and of course there will be that impetus in that direction. But but I suspect that it will have a counter movement as well, where people just go, oh wow. This this thing with the headset off is just another headset. That's it's not the reality. So it may actually help. Um, I, I use it in my my discussions, and I find that, that for the younger generation, just talking about this as a headset is a big big help to them. They, that's usually when I say we don't see reality as it is to people, you know, older people. There there's like nothing I can do to help them. It's just like that's crazy. You don't see the truth. BS. That's just crazy. But for the younger generation, I've got this metaphor. They get it, and it's it's not a big deal. They may, they may not believe it, but at least at least it's not, you know, prima facie crazy. That's such an interesting viewpoint because I, I never saw it that way. That you could actually become aware that your life might be a headset because you were wearing and you removed the actual headset. That's right. I, I want to get into the fact: Will AI? We talked about if it will downgrade um, human consciousness. You said in your TED talk, in almost every simulation, organisms that see none of reality but are just tuned to fitness drive to extinctions all the organisms that see reality as it is. And so here it brings up the question, if AI is going to be the most tuned to fitness, then is it AI that's going to drive us to extinction? I'm not too worried about that. Um... Part of it is that the, the the stuff about fitness and extinction is for organisms that that evolve and, and so forth, and that's the the AIs right now don't. Now that would be interesting to see if we actually get self building AIs that that can replicate themselves in, in some step. That that would certainly change that dynamics quite a bit. Um, I'm not. There, there's a lot of fear right now about AIs and causing human extinction. I don't see it. Uh, I'm not not too worried. I've been in. I started at the artificial intelligence lab at MIT in 1979. Um, I've been an AI. I've, I've seen the the history of it. I've been part of it. Uh, you know, we went through a, a few decades of of being out of favor, and then it's come back into favor, and so forth. There was a 
uh, a period there where I was embarrassed to say that I'd been involved, that I was involved in AI, you know, but now, now it's the, the rage. I'm not too concerned about AI and, and extinction any more than I'm concerned about uh, any other advanced technology like um, bioengineering, right? So genetic engineering. That ha has done a lot of good. Of course, it could be used to create weaponized genes that could destroy targeted races, for example, or the whole human race. Every technology, not just AI, every technology that offers us a real boost in the quality of our life can also kill us. Every technology. AI is not special in that regard. And so we should have the, the normal kind of laws and safeguards that we normally have for these kinds of things. But uh, the genie's out of the bottle. There's no way of putting the AI... Uh, same thing with the um, genetic engineering. That genie's out of the bottle. And at some point, some kid with test tubes in their house could engineer something that could be devastating. Um, so, so that AI is not, nothing special. And, and frankly, in the case of AI, trying to police it is, is not possible in, in the following sense. Any smart kid with a laptop can develop algorithms. And we don't want to have governments looking at every laptop, that's for sure. I mean, I would be more afraid of that than of the little kid playing with his laptop. So, so we, we have to balance the rights of the citizens against the, um, the duty of government to protect its citizens um, from bad actors and so forth. I do have a question. But uh, sorry to interrupt, but it's just okay. it came to mind, so I don't forget. Um, did you happen to see the new Neuralink implant? Um, they did the first one. Yeah, I saw about them. I haven't actually studied it yet, but I've heard about it. Yeah, with Musk. Yeah, so it was actually a, a handic handicap that they implanted the Neuralink, and he was able to feel the sensations of his hand, but his hands were not moving. That's really That's cool. cool. And then. It, yeah, and I haven't read up on that. Yeah, I was so fascinated when I saw it. And then the question came to mind, okay, but how will this actually, because then it's ingrained in your mind. And so there is no kind of way maybe to remove the headset. So how does that affect consciousness and awakening to reality and to truth? There's no doubt that these kinds of interactions will be able to alter the kinds of experiences, the conscious experiences that we have. In you know, it doesn't even have to be that high tech. We, we LSD does that, right? So we, we know that there are L interventions that you can make that take you to new new places. Um, William James is famous for talking about that. I think he'd taken nitrous oxide or something like that, and 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 he he said you know our what we call our every normal day consciousness is is separated by the the filmiest the thinnest films from other modes of, of conscious experience. And so our assumption that our mode of conscious experience is the, the, the right one or the correct one or the, the only one um, quickly falls apart. And, and so, and I think the meditative traditions also point to that, that, that you know, there's many, many other forms of consciousness. So, so yeah, the, the neural link and other, you know, prosthetic devices that will interact with brains directly will surely expand uh, our horizons uh, in terms of our conscious experiences. There, there is a question whether the AIs themselves can be conscious, right? So that's, and, and that was part of your previous question, I think, was could, could AIs actually be conscious? And the way that that's normally thought of is <clears throat> the assumption is, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that space and time are fundamental. Physical objects, particles, protons, <clears throat> neutrons, bosons, leptons, and quarks. These are fundamental entities inside space-time. 
If they assemble into complicated enough structures like brains and neurons and so forth, <clears throat> then somehow that, that substrate can give rise to conscious experiences. That's the, the normal approach. And <clears throat> most of my colleagues studying consciousness assume that there's some physical substrate that is not conscious, but when it has the right properties, then it gives rise to consciousness. And so and from that point of view, they, they would say that, yes, once we understand how a substrate, an unconscious substrate can give rise to consciousness, then yeah, we'll be able to build AIs that are, that are conscious. Now, <clears throat> I would point out a, a remarkable fact. These are my friends, collaborators, um, colleagues who are, who are doing this work on consciousness. And they're smart. They're, they're really, really smart. Some of them are geniuses. And they have a number of theories out there. And, but here's the remarkable fact. There are thousands of specific tastes that we can have, millions of colors, countless smells that we can smell, all sorts of sounds that we can hear, millions and millions of different sounds, bodily sensations. So there are billions of specific conscious experiences that we have. So scientists have been working on their theories of conscious experiences for 30 years now. How many of, you know, so there's billions of experiences to choose from and in, in, to, to model and, and to give a theory of. So, and, and these people are genius. So how many experiences have, the, have these theories modeled? Zero. We, we are batting zero. There is not a single conscious experience that has been given a mathematical explanation by any theory. Global workspace theory, um, integrated information theory, um, neuronal, orchestrated collapse of neuronal microtubules, higher order theories, um, perceptual theories, uh, and also the illusion theories. So the attention schema theories where they say there's no such thing as conscious experiences. You, the, the brain just creates the illusion of it. They've not been able to give a mathematical model that shows how even one illusion is, is made, not one. And then they certainly would owe that as a scientist. It's not enough to say it's an illusion. Okay, well, then what exact mathematically precise brain activity must be the illusion of chocolate and could not be the illusion of vanilla, right? That's, if we're going to do science, you've got to answer a question like that. So, so the answer is they're batting zero. There, there are, there's nothing on the table, literally nothing. And I think it's for principled reasons. You can't boot up consciousness from unconscious ingredients. Can't be done. Consciousness is fundamental. Consciousness is the deep, beyond concept truth. And what we call space and time in the physical world is a trivial projection of this much deeper reality of consciousness. So, so we have the notion of consciousness and intelligence completely wrong. Right. This is this is worse than flat Earth. This is we're, we're backwards. We think that the the brain from its organization is somehow giving rise to intelligence and to consciousness. Nothing could be further from the truth. First, neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. So they couldn't. They 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 have no causal powers. Neurons are what you see in your headset version of the world when you look inside things we call skulls. Then you see. Then you render neurons, but neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. But when we see the structure of the brain, and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, so by the way, I'm not putting down neuroscience. I am a neuroscientist, cognitive neuroscientist. And I think it needs more funding, not less, because you know, the, the, the neurons in the brain look really complicated. There's 86 billion neurons, roughly the same number of glial cells, trillions and trillions of synapses. It's, it's a mess. But that's just the interface. That's the veneer. The reality is far more complicated. We have so neuroscience is much much harder than most neuroscientists realize. You know, eighty six billion neurons is bad, but that's trivial compared to the reverse engineering that we have to do to whatever the reality is that's behind space and time, and and that neuroscience will really have to understand. So so the way that neuroscientists are thinking about this, like in predictive processing models of intelligence or consciousness, is that you see when we look at the brain, we see this predictive processing kind of model. And, and I think that's right. From that perspective, pr predictive processing uh, 
for our headset version of the brain and what it's doing is, is correct. But, but that, our picture of the brain is a trivial projection of a much deeper reality of consciousness in which there is no predictive processing, in which, in fact, there is no arrow of time. The, the model that I'm working on is a, a dynamical model of consciousness in which there, the entropy is constant or can be constant. It doesn't have to increase. There need be no arrow of time. But when you take a projection of it, then you will necessarily, it's a theorem that you will get increasing entropy. You will get an arrow of time. So, so this is a, so most people think predictive processing is the way to really understand how intelligence is created and how consciousness perhaps emerges. I'm saying ch change it around. Predictive processing is an, the artifact that you get from the loss of information from a dynamical system in which there is no arrow of time, there is no predictive processing. So what you're seeing is not how the brain creates intelligence and consciousness. What you're seeing instead is how an infinite intelligence gets shoehorned into the tiny little intelligence that we call human intelligence and the tiny little consciousness. So you can see how big the difference is. Instead of saying predictive processing is, is the theory about how consciousness and, and, and intelligence emerges, no, it's, it's, it's showing us how a much greater intelligence and consciousness gets shoehorned into a trivial, a, a relatively trivial intelligence and consciousness that we call the human intelligence consciousness. So, so what, what this means, though, is, of course, we should study predictive processing. We should study neurals. Absolutely. I, I've published papers myself almost 30 years ago on that kind of thing. So, I mean, this is, I like it. it it's, but it, it, once again, you have to be very humble about your theories. Our theories are not the final word. Um, they're baby steps in, in a never-ending journey of science, literally never ending. So, so I think ultimately that AIs, if you're thinking about AIs being conscious in, in the framework of I'm taking these unconscious circuits and software and building up a conscious, no, that, that'll never happen. But there's a different way of looking at things. Space-time is just an interface and it gives us portals into consciousness, right? I'm on this Zoom screen or Riverside screen with you. Um, and some pixels I see are of your shirt and they're not giving me much insight into consciousness, but some are pixels of your face and they're giving me a lot of insight into your conscious experiences, what you, whether you're in, interested in what I'm saying or whatever it might be. Now, it's not the case that some pixels are conscious pixels and other pixels are unconscious pixels. That's dumb. That, that's that's numbskull misunderstanding of what a zoom screen or a riverside screen did. the pixels are just pixels some of them give me a portal and so they, they provide a channel to understand your conscious experience and others don't but the pixels themselves are neither conscious nor unconscious in a similar way i i say the distinction that we make in everyday space-time life between living and non-living or between conscious and unconscious is not principled. Those distinctions are not principal distinctions. They're merely artifacts of the loss of information in our space-time headset. So, so what that means then is we can't think about using stuff inside space-time like circuits and software to create consciousness. But what we could ask ourselves is we do know that there are portals into consciousness. Right? Our headset allows portals, and we know there's one technology, there is one technology that we know that can systematically and, and reliably build new portals into consciousness. And that technology is having kids. So if we reverse engineer that technology, if we understand it, then we might, well, if we actually get you know these positive geometries outside of space time and the theory of consciousness behind those, we really understand at least the first couple layers of software outside of our headset. If we can understand the first few layers of software outside of our headset, then we may be able to reverse engineer our headset and open up new portals into consciousness. And when we do that, the 
avatars of that opening in our headset may look like AIs. It won't be that unconscious circuits and software are somehow creating consciousness magically. It's rather that when consciousness projects itself into our headset in a new way, that projection might look like AIs and, and, and so forth. So, and by the way, you know, if, if what I'm saying is right, um, <clears throat> entrepreneurs can make money. And I'm not, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur, so I'm just throwing this out there. Predictive processing is the rage now, and it should be. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's wonderful. It's powerful. And I've been involved in it. And, and there are AI companies being built on it and so forth. But if predictive processing is actually the dumbed down version that you get from a consciousness that, that, uh, that's infinite, that's projecting into a particular space-time in, uh, headset. And, and so you, you're all, all predictive processing is as a projected model of a much deeper consciousness. Then a company that actually is trying to model the, you know, at least first layers of this consciousness beyond space-time will have uh, a leg up on the predictive processing models. So that's just fascinating because we're just, it's, it's so hard to speak about something that is beyond words and to try to put it into this physical world and how AI is going to influence it and is, is so interesting. To come back to the avatar question, which I, I think is central because a lot of people are stuck believing that they are the self-image, right? Right. From, of course, we deeply believe it, right? And, and we have the fear, all of us have the, the fear of death as, as a result of that. Most of us do. <clears throat> 99% of us plus. Um, I think, and, and by the way, if someone put a gun to my head, I'd be afraid. So, so deep down, despite meditation and all the intellectual work I'm doing and the science, right? <clears throat> there, I'm programmed. I'm deeply programmed to um, be identified with this body as, you know, and, and to think that it really is me. I mean, we're, we're deeply programmed to do that. That's what I was saying earlier. Uh, the, the one jumps in with both feet, jumps into this simulation with both feet. It, it loses itself completely. But ultimately, I think it does that to slowly and painfully wake up and realize that it infinitely transcends this particular perspective, but now it has truly integrated that perspective into its understanding of itself. As, as in, I mean, this is an impressive world. It's beautiful, it's complicated, and yet compared to who we are, it's trivial. So in some sense, consciousness knows what it is by knowing really well what it's not, or what it's not just. Thank you very much, Fuad. It's been a great pleasure to talk. And, and that truth that they're going to be exposed to is themselves. Well, I have uh, a Twitter account. So if people want to see, I post stuff that I'm doing on Twitter. It's at Donald D. Hoffman. Yeah, I can send you that if you want to. Put so so I, I post there pretty regularly. And and, um, and then if if I'm giving a talk at the Science of Consciousness Conference in Tucson, um, Arizona, in, in April this month. So in about three weeks, I'll be, uh, if all goes well, I'll be in Tucson giving a, an hour-long talk there. So people interested, they can see not just my talk, but there's a lot of fun talks for a whole week there. So that's a good place to catch up on what's happening in consciousness. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Bob. Uh, yeah, for me too. It was, it was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. And you asked some great questions. So thank you a lot. Okay.